The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The nation was established in 1945 and was dissolved in 1992. The modern nations that came about were Slovenia, Croatia, Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, and recently, Kosovo. All six of these nations were established in order to give a homeland to the predominant ethnicities that resided in Yugoslavia. Quickly after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, many of these nations had their own independence movements to deal with. And unfortunately, these independence movements would spur into violent conflicts, one in particular being the 1998 Kosovo conflict. On February 28, 1998, the KLA, or Kosovo Liberation Army, would begin their attacks against the Serbian government. Initially, the KLA would go out of their way to attack police stations, but then their acts would escalate. They would go on to attack government buildings and cities with weapons that they smuggled from Albania, with their motives stemming from the fact that Albanians living in Serbia felt disenfranchised. They wanted to establish their own autonomous region within Serbia with the intentions of merging with Albania in the future. Between the years of 1998 and 1999, the KLA would continue to attack former Yugoslavian officials that resided in the Kosovo region. As a result, Serbian paramilitary groups retaliated, and the collateral damage was significant. Between 1,500 and 2,000 civilians died during this conflict between KLA combatants and Serbian paramilitary groups. And within one year, approximately 370,000 Kosovar Albanians would be displaced. They lost their homes and businesses, all because of this conflict. This made many Kosovar Albanian civilians vulnerable to attacks from Serbian paramilitary groups. These attacks against innocent people garnered the attention of NATO, who classified this as a humanitarian war. And on March 24th, 1999, NATO made their presence known in the area with an aerial bombing campaign. And after nearly a month of constant bombing, the Kosovo War was over. The war would officially be over on June 9th, after the Kumanovo Agreement was signed. It was a capitulation agreement that prevented the Serbian government from occupying the Kosovo territory, and it established basic relations between Kosovo and Serbia. Quickly after the agreement was signed, the Serbian military withdrew from the Kosovo territory, and after the dust settled, the UN started examining the human rights violations that happened during this short conflict, with one violation in particular taking center stage. NATO didn't have the permission of the UN to enter Serbian airspace and bomb the nation. These unsanctioned bombings caused at least 488 Yugoslav civilian deaths, including a substantial amount of Kosovar refugees. This is an image of a Kosovar refugee. He was a father of two sons, and he was walking around to any person with a camera and asking them if they knew where his sons were. His picture, and the pictures of many others that were taken during this conflict, showed the whole world the levels of human suffering that occurred during this war. The whereabouts of this man are unknown, but the whereabouts of his family are. His sons were alive. They were simply separated from him during the conflict, and as a result of his photo being taken, he would be helped by many others to be reunited with them. This is Andrea Pia Kennedy. She was born in Houston, Texas on July 2nd, 1964, and she was the youngest of five in her family. Much of her early childhood is unknown, but during her late teenage years, she gained notoriety for being quite intelligent. She graduated from Milby High School in 1982, and she was not only the class valedictorian, but the captain of the swim team and the officer in the National Honor Society. She would then go on to study for two years at the University of Houston to become a nurse, all while dealing with severe depression and bulimia. Even with those issues, she did manage to graduate from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. And from 1986 to 1994, she worked as a registered nurse. 
and this is where she would meet her husband, Rusty Yates. And quickly after meeting each other, on April 17th, 1993, the two got married. And this was to be expected. The two had much in common. One thing in particular that they shared was their religion. They were both evangelical Christians. And they both believed and announced to their friends that they intended on creating a large family, specifically saying that they would seek to have as many babies as nature allowed. Andrea and Rusty would go on to have five children in total. Noah, seven years old, John, five years old, Paul, three years old, Luke, two years old, and Mary, six months old. Unfortunately, after the birth of Andrea's fourth child, Luke, her depression and suicidal ideation became more serious. On June 6, 1999, Rusty found her shaking and chewing her fingers. The next day, she attempted suicide by overdosing on pills, leading to her being hospitalized and prescribed antidepressants. Unfortunately, this would be the first of many times where she would be hospitalized because of a suicide attempt. And after each time she was sent to the hospital, she would come back with even more prescribed medication. Unfortunately, all but one seemed to actually have a positive effect on her. The medication was called Halidol. It was an antipsychotic drug, and according to Rusty, her behavior and emotional state improved immediately. Or at least enough where she seemed stable. Andrea Yates had seen multiple psychologists at this point, but when interviewed, her first psychologist goes into detail about how she told Rusty Yates to not have any more children with Andrea Yates, because if she were to give birth to an additional child, it would guarantee a future psychotic depression. Unfortunately though, Andrea Yates and Rusty decided to have a fifth and final child. Her name was Mary. And this was the tipping point for Andrea Yates. While coping with the fact that she gave birth to another child, Andrea's father passed away. She would soon stop taking her medication. She mutilated herself and read the Bible feverishly, and stopped feeding Mary altogether. She became so incapacitated that she required immediate hospitalization. On April 1st, 2001, Yates came under the care of Dr. Muhammad Saeed. She was treated, then released. On May 3rd, 2001, she completely degenerated back into a near catatonic state and filled the bathtub in the middle of the day. She would later confess to the police that she planned to drown the children that day, but decided against doing it then. It would be a month until the worst would happen. On June 20th, 2001, Rusty Yates left for work, leaving Andrea Yates alone to watch the children, and this was against Dr. Saeed's instructions to supervise her around the clock. Rusty's mother, Dora Yates, had been scheduled to arrive an hour to take over for Andrea. In the space of that hour, Andrea Yates drowned all five of her children. Yates started with John, Paul, and Luke, and laid them out in her bed. She then drowned Mary, whom she left floating in the bathtub. Noah came in and asked what she was doing with Mary. He then ran, but Yates soon caught and drowned him. She left him floating in the tub and laid Mary in John's arms in the bed. She then called the police, repeatedly saying she needed an officer but refusing to say why. She then called Rusty and told him to come home right away. Andrea Yates confessed to drowning her children. She purposefully waited for her husband to leave for work because she knew that Rusty would absolutely stop her from killing their children. She also decided to put the family dog in the crate to make sure that the dog wouldn't even interfere in her murder. On January 9th, 2006, Andrea Yates entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. On February 1st, 2006, she was granted release on bail on the condition that she be admitted to a mental health facility. On July 26, 2006, after three days of deliberations, Yates was found not guilty by reason of insanity and as defined by the state of Texas, she was thereafter committed to the North Texas State Hospital Vernon campus. In January 2007, she was moved to Carryville State Hospital, a low security mental facility in Carryville, Texas. And she will remain there for the rest of her life. This plane is flight JAT-637. On January 25th, 1972, it was flying from Stockholm to Belgrade, with stops at Copenhagen and Zagreb. And during this flight, a woman named Vesna Volvik was working. She was a stewardess, and little did she know that her presence on this flight would be marked in history forever. Vesna Volvik was born in Belgrade on January 3rd, 1950. Her father was a businessman and her mother was a fitness instructor. Her childhood is largely unknown, but her motivations to travel are. She wanted to see the Beatles. So the first time she ever left Serbia was to go to London to see a concert and also get the opportunity to learn English. She really enjoyed traveling, so much so that she wanted to make a career out of it. So she applied to become a flight attendant on Yugoslav Airlines. This would give her the ability to travel to new places all while earning a paycheck. And for many of the flights that she was on, 
everything was normal. She would even attempt to purchase a souvenir for her family at every new nation or city that she visited. JAT Flight 367 departed from Stockholm at 1.30 p.m. on the 26th of January. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas DC-9, and it landed at Copenhagen at 2.30 p.m., where Insipan, Volvic, and her colleagues boarded the plane. They would usher many of the passengers out, and Volvic would notice that one passenger seemed very troubled, like he had been annoyed by something. Other crew members mentioned just how disgruntled this man was, but nobody thought anything else other than that. The man simply got his things and left the plane. Once the plane was cleaned and prepped, new passengers boarded, and at 3.15 p.m., Flight 367 departed from Copenhagen, and at 4.01 p.m., an explosion tore through the DC-9's baggage compartment. The explosion caused the aircraft to break apart over the Czechoslovak village of Sabrinka Kaminsk. Volvik was the only survivor of 28 passengers and crew. She would be left screaming on the ground under pieces of the plane, and she would be discovered by a local villager named Bruno. Bruno was able to find her by recognizing her uniform. It was turquoise, so it stood out against the snow and other wreckage. She was also screaming in pain, but fortunately, Bruno had been a medic during the Second World War and was able to keep Volvik alive until rescuers arrived. After she was stabilized and after all of the wreckage was cleaned up, air safety investigators attributed Volvik's survival to her being trapped by a food cart in the DC-9's fuselage as it broke away from the rest of the aircraft and plummeted towards the ground. But that wasn't it. Even after the explosion, the rapid decompression of the cabin should have killed her. But she wasn't. Because Volvik was trapped inside of the fuselage, she wasn't thrown out into the air. She fell with the rest of the wreckage, which preserved her life. The portion of the plane that she was trapped in collided with trees and snow, and those two obstacles were just strong enough to break the fall of the wreckage that she was attached to, preserving her life. It was also discovered that Volvik had low blood pressure, which caused her to pass out immediately when the cabin decompressed, which both made her limp and slowed down her heartbeat. Her being limp made her more flexible when she hit the ground at approximately 200 kilometers per hour, and her heartbeat being slow made sure that her heart didn't burst on impact. Now the exact altitude of the flight is unknown, but on average, the cruising altitude of a jet airplane is between 33,000 feet and 42,000 feet. And to this day, she is the only human on the planet to ever have survived such a fall. But because she survived doesn't mean that she came away scot-free. Following the crash, Volvic spent days in a coma, having fractured her skull and suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. She also suffered two broken legs and three broken vertebrae, one of which was completely crushed. Her pelvis was fractured and several ribs were broken. Her injuries resulted in her being temporarily paralyzed below the waist. She developed total amnesia from the hour preceding her fall until one month afterwards. So why did this happen? Who blew up the plane? Well, between 1962 and 1982, Croatian nationalists carried out 128 terrorist attacks against the Yugoslav civilian and military targets. Yugoslav authorities suspected that they were to blame for bringing down the Flight 367. It was a simple briefcase bomb that was placed in the baggage compartment, and the person who was responsible has never been found. This is Kartiko, an orangutan who lived in the Indo-Malayan pavilion at the Toronto Zoo. And in 1998, a visitor at the orangutan exhibit threw cookies to the animals, sparking a frenzy that caused Kartiko to fall into the moat surrounding the cage. He remained underwater for at least two minutes and was rescued by a visitor who had lifeguard training. Another visitor gave Kartiko mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and was able to revive him. During the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, things were difficult. Kartiko's mouth was just too big. However, the woman who decided to save Kartiko that day decided to quickly roll up her zoo program, place it into his mouth, and blow air into his lungs. He would be alive for a few days before succumbing to pneumonia. This plaque was made in order to honor Kartiko, and it has this to say. Born June 4th, 1990, died August 5th, 1998. Despite heroic efforts by visitors and staff, Kartiko died as a result of events set in motion by an unknown family who thoughtlessly threw food into the orangutan exhibit. Please do not feed any animals when you visit the zoo for Kartiko's sake. This is a picture of Marilyn Stanley and her boyfriend Zachary Gross. When Marilyn met Zachary, he seemed sweet when they started dating. 
somebody that she could completely gel with. But after the honeymoon stage of their relationship, Zachary began to show his true colors. Marilyn would describe him as a controlling bully, and she would soon dump him because of his behavior. But that didn't stop him. He would ambush her and beat her on occasion. He would stalk her at work. And in a desperate attempt to appease him, Marilyn agreed to meet up with Zachary one last time with the intentions of cutting things off completely and getting him out of her life. Zachary didn't take this well. He flew into a jealous rage, picked up a razor, and began to scalp Marilyn. He wanted to cut off all of her hair and maim her. He then went on to break her nose, blacken her eyes, and then choke her until she was unconscious. This physical abuse wasn't uncommon. When they were still dating, Zachary consistently beat her, and then would quickly apologize afterwards with the intention of regaining her trust. But after they broke up and made some distance, Zachary would always try to reconnect. And in this case, his jealousy took over, and he viciously attacked Marilyn. And apparently what sparked the jealousy was a Facebook tag. Marilyn had tagged a guy in a different photo, and Zachary thought that this dude was potentially romantically interested in Marilyn. This assumption was enough to encourage Zachary to pin Marilyn down on the ground and assault her by punching her in the face continuously, all while trying to cut off her hair. Marilyn, still lucid at this point, tried to reach for a knife that was on the ground. Unfortunately, she wouldn't be able to use it because she would be attacked by Zachary's dog, who was walking freely throughout his house. All while Zachary's dog was chewing on Marilyn's ear, Zachary was gloating about how ugly Marilyn looked after he cut off her hair and scalped her. Marilyn would eventually be able to get the dog off of her ear, and she would go on to stagger into the bathroom to assess her injuries. She didn't want to look into the mirror, but she did know that she was severely injured. Her hair and head was soaked in blood. He ripped clumps of my hair out, I thought. Get on the floor on your side, he ordered as I stumbled back in. Terrified, I did what I was told. I'm gonna break your ribs. He then kicked and stomped on my side. He kept going until I heard a distinct crack. By then, I was so out of it, I didn't feel any pain. I thought I was dying. Over the next two hours, Zachary beat, kicked, and taunted me. Finally, he wiped the blood from my face and said he was finished and that I could go. I begged for an ambulance. No, they'll take Capone. He said he'd drop me off. I thought he meant the hospital. As we were leaving, he handed me a bloody plastic bag. I saw wisps of blonde hair, and I thought it contained clumps he had pulled out. He drove me past my mom's house, and then he stopped one street down. Can I have a kiss? He asked before letting me go. My skin crawled. Mom went white when she saw me. My hair is in the bag, Mom, I said holding it up. She called an ambulance, and I was taken to a hospital and rushed into emergency surgery. A severed artery in my scalp was pumping out blood. I didn't really know what was going on. Hours later, Marilyn would wake up after surgery and would be told that the injuries to her scalp were very severe and that most of her hair is not going to grow back. She needed an emergency skin graft from her thigh in order to repair her scalp. The moment she heard that was the moment she realized in shock that the bloody plastic bag that she was handed by Zach wasn't filled with clumps of hair. It was various different portions of her scalp that Zachary had removed and placed in the bag for her to discover. Marilyn to this day has had multiple surgeries to try and repair the damage, but the damage was so extensive that even to this day she still has to wear wigs. After Zachary was arrested for the attack, Marilyn decided to take in the dog that he owned, Capone, because she felt that the dog didn't mean to attack her, and the dog needs a home. In March of 2017, Zachary was sent to prison for 21 years for first degree assault and many other offenses. As of right now, Marilyn is happy with her son and is trying her best to recover from the trauma that she gained from this vicious attack. This is the port city of Duluth in Minnesota, and currently has a population of 86,000 people. It's one of the oldest cities in Minnesota, and today I'm going to tell you an infamous story that comes from that town. Duluth, Minnesota was established as an industrial city. As a result, many of the people who worked there were poor or middle class, and during the early 1900s there was severe competition for the limited amount of industrial jobs in the town. As a result, the majority white population of that town had a lot of animosity towards the growing immigrant and black populations in the town who were drawn by the lucrative industrial work. And unfortunately, this animosity would degenerate into full-blown violence. 
In September of 1918, a Finnish immigrant named Ali Kinkokin was lynched for allegedly dodging military service in World War I, which the United States had recently entered. Kinkokin was found dead, having been tarred and feathered, and hanged in a tree in Leicester Park. Unfortunately, authorities didn't pursue the investigation because they claimed he'd committed suicide after the shame of being tarred and feathered. During and immediately following World War I, even more immigrant populations would enter Duluth. One major immigrant population were black Americans who were leaving agricultural jobs in the Deep South for industrial work in the North. These black Americans also sought better education and a social environment where their presence was somewhat tolerated. But unfortunately, that racial tolerance that was promised to them couldn't be found in Duluth because on June 15th, 1920, the worst would happen. Just a day before, on June 14th, the John Robinson Circus arrived into Duluth for a free parade and one-night performance. Two local white teenagers, Irene Tuscan, age 19, and James Jimmy Sullivan, 18, met up to watch the circus and ended up behind the big top. They were watching the black workers dismantle the circus tent and load wagons and generally get the circus ready to move on. It is unknown what took place between Tuscan and Sullivan and the workers, but later that night, Sullivan claimed to his father that he and Tuscan were assaulted, and that specifically Irene Tuscan was sexually assaulted and robbed by five or six black circus workers that were a part of the crew. In the early morning of June 15th, the Duluth police chief, John Murphy, received a call from James Sullivan's father, saying six black circus workers had held his son and girlfriend at gunpoint, then sexually assaulted and robbed Irene Tuscan. Chief Murphy lined up 150 or so roustabouts, or circus workers, and asked James Sullivan and Tuscan to identify their attackers. The police arrested six black men as suspects in connection with the sexual assault and robbery and held them in custody in the city jail, but they wouldn't remain there long. Newspapers printed articles about the alleged assault, and rumors spread in the white community about it, including that Tuscan was dying from her injuries. That evening, a mob between 1,000 and 10,000 men formed outside of the Duluth City Jail, and they forced their way into the jail, pulling the six black men from their cells and dragging them into the street. They seized Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. They took them out into the street and had a kangaroo court, convicting them of Tuscan's assault. And quickly after, the mob took the three men one block to the intersection of 1st Street and 2nd Avenue Street, where they beat them and hanged them from a light pole. And the image you're looking at now is the infamous image of this moment. The killings made headlines throughout the country. The Chicago Evening Post wrote, This is a crime of a northern state, as black and ugly as any that has brought the South in dispute. The Duluth authorities stand condemned in the eyes of the nation. Much attention was placed on Duluth, Minnesota for what happened. Many condemned the mob for taking justice into their own hands and killing three people without giving them a trial. And in response to all of this condemnation, the acting police chief declared, we're going to run out all idle blacks out of Superior and they're going to stay out. Two days later, on June 17th, Judge William Kant and the grand jury had a difficult time identifying the lead mob members. In the end, the grand jury issued 37 indictments for the lynching mob. 25 were rioting and 12 came for the crime of murder in the first degree. Some men were indicted on both charges. Three men in particular were only charged of rioting. Louis Donado, Carl Hamburg, and Gilbert Stevenson were convicted, but only served 15 months in prison, and they were the only ones to see any real jail time. The crime of mayhem is a common law criminal offense consisting of the intentional maiming of another person. Modern statutes in the United States define mayhem as disabling or disfiguring, such as rendering useless a member of another person's arms or legs. And this woman, Bertha Baronda, was found guilty of that crime. There isn't much information on her background, but she was born on March 14, 1877, and she lived most of her life in Minnesota. And at the age of 24, she would marry Frank Baronda. And for six years, things were rocky. Frank Baronda wasn't the most faithful husband, and he would consistently abuse her. And on the night of May 30th, 1907, Frank Baronda came home late. He insisted that he was just working late as a fireman, but Bertha didn't believe him. She insisted that the reason he was out late was because he visited a brothel. It's unknown how long they argued, but once Frank Baronda was asleep, Bertha Baronda picked up a straight razor and cut off his genitals. Fortunately, the firehouse was nearby and he was able to receive emergency treatment, but at this point, Bertha Baronda had run out of the house and vanished into the night. She would quickly be apprehended, but was found disguised wearing man's clothing and mounting a bicycle to make her escape. She admitted to her crime and expressed no regret for her actions. 
On June 1st, Frank Baronda made a complaint to Justice Brown from his hospital bed at the Red Cross Hospital that Miss Baronda was accused of mayhem, the felony of mayhem being punishable up to 14 years in prison at the time, and was defined by Section 204 of the Criminal Code that every person who unlawfully or maliciously deprives a human being of a member of his body, or renders it useless, or cuts or disables the tongue, nose, ear, or lip is guilty of mayhem, and she was held on a $10,000 bond which is equivalent to nearly $300,000 today. Mr. Baronda testified at the trial that he and his wife had visited the San Jose Theater and that the attack was unprovoked. He claimed that she was amorous and had invited him over to the bed before the attack. The prosecution's theory was that this was a deliberate planned attack in furtherance of jealous rage. Mrs. Baronda had several defenses, chief among them being that she didn't remember anything from the night. She claimed that she'd become enraged at her husband, and that the two had an argument because she thought that he was going to leave her. She admitted that she maimed him, but expressed no regret. Eventually, the defense attorney settled on emotional insanity, claiming that she was feeling extreme jealousy, and that motivated her actions. The jury deliberated for two hours before convicting her. Bertha Baronda was sentenced to five years in prison, but only served two, and was released from prison on December 20th, 1909. The average speed a plane takes while falling from the sky is 125 miles per hour. And when you collide into the ground at 125 miles per hour, this is what you look like. Armit Paul Singh, 29 years old, was a recreational pilot. And on May 31st, 2014, he and his passenger Jatinder Singh, 31, were killed instantly when the two-seat Cessna crashed into a wheat field shortly after takeoff. A recording from a GoPro camera on the plane recovered from the crash site showed the pilot taking selfies with the flash during the nighttime takeoff shortly before the crash. No GoPro footage exists of the pilot's flight, but after an extensive NTSB investigation, they said based on the evidence of the cell phone use during low altitude maneuvering, including the flight immediately before the accident flight, it is likely that cell phone use during the accident flight distracted the pilot and contributed to the development of spatial disorientation and subsequent loss of control. Addiction is defined as a neurotypical symptom that presents itself as a pervasive and intense urge to engage in maladaptive behaviors, providing immediate sensory rewards, despite their harmful consequences. And that last portion is important to note. Those who struggle with addiction will do anything to feed it, even if those actions come at the expense of others. A just released autopsy shows two young girls died from hyperthermia in August. According to Raleigh Police, two year old Amora Lou Milbourne and her three year old sister Trinity Michelle Milbourne were pronounced dead at Duke Raleigh Hospital back on August 27th. Their mother, 29 year old Lonise Battle, has been charged with two counts of murder. It's believed Battle was at the Vegas style sweepstakes parlor in North Raleigh the night they died. When interviewed, Investigators said that the children were left in a car parked behind a gambling establishment between 2.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. After leaving the gambling establishment, Battle returned to her car and drove her children to the hospital. Once arriving at the hospital, they were immediately pronounced dead, with the cause being hypothermia. And unfortunately, this is a common problem with children being left in vehicles alone. When left in the sun for a long period of time, they can become an oven, even if you crack the window. As of right now, Lawrence Battle has been charged with the murder of her two children, with many believing that at the conclusion of her trial, she may receive significant jail time for her negligence. What's up everyone, it's your boy Aileris, aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video, and if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam, what you doing watching videos and not subscribing, and if you're old, make sure to hit that bell so you get these notifications every time. I know it's been nearly four months since the last Morbid Reality installment, and the reason being is that this stuff takes a while to produce. I really go out of my way to find some crazy historical and 
dark content for you guys just for this subreddit, so I hope the wait was worth it. And I wouldn't be able to make content like this without my Patreon supporters. So a big thank you to Fitz Chivalry, Din Corda, Code Connor Purvis, Nat Matt, Tifa is better than Aerith, Aelorus's mom, The Clan, S16, Green Pasta Man, Squish, Rin Hex, Mr. Bean, My Golden Experience, Clifford, James Tucker, Lucas Adams, Big Boy Bailey, BMX30, Willinda, Cinnamon Sticks, Scott, Rivka, The Fake Musician, Buckethead, Samantha Bellhart, Admin Fanneker, Zach F, Bloody Hunter 44, Keeley, Dunder Nas Hawk, Bones, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon user, Noah, and Catherine Taylor. Thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one to my merch store and one to my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.